My name is Birgitte Kehler Holst. I work for the Danish Museum Association, and I'm the leader of an initiative called the Green Museum Academy, which I will speak on later this day. I like to begin with saying that I myself have suffered from what would you call climate anxiety or just feeling hopelessness. But recently, I decided that that was just too hard. So I decided to focus on the extreme privilege it is to be part of the solution. Because we've seen report after report coming out with huge, very depressing numbers of the state of our planet. And it hasn't really made that much of an impact. What does make an impact is to make people engage emotionally and intellectually and in their communities with being part of the solution. And thank you so much for Kirsten Dunlop to remind us that that is the power we have to actually engage people. I have the privilege to introduce three people here today that are already part of the solution, that are actually working with transforming their community and helping the planet. We'll do it this way. We have each a presentation for the three people in the panel. They'll be sitting down there so that they can actually see what their other people are presenting. And then after that, we'll have a panel discussion up here. So please welcome our first speaker, Julia from the Anchor Museum. And Julia, if you would please, just instead of me introducing you, I think you're probably better at telling people why you're here. Sure. So thank you. Good morning, or happy middle of the night if you're from Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm the director and CEO of the Anchorage Museum in Alaska. Alaska is the only reason the United States is an Arctic country. Um, we, like Finland, um, are a place that thinks about climate realities every day and all that we do. Um, so in my mind, uh, the museum has a really obvious imperative to be uh, talking about these climate realities, um, but I think most importantly, repositioning the way we think to be not places of the past, but really to be instruments in helping people imagine um, all of the possible futures. This is the Anchorage Museum, at least this is a slice of it. Um, I show this image because um, on our facade in a lot of different ways, um, and as you enter the building, we first acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. Uh, we are, Anchorage exists on Denina land. The Denina people have stewarded the place for uh, millennia, and we have uh, a lot to learn from the Denina and other indigenous people. Um, so we acknowledge that first as we talk about place and planet and people. We just opened this exhibition a few weeks ago. This is an exhibition called How to Survive, um, where we talk about climate change, although we do try to resist the climate change exhibition that feels really episodic to us. Um, we think that in the way we talk about climate needs to be integrated into all the things we do and the way we are, but this is an exhibition that looks at um, the future of the planet um, through female artists, female identifying artists, uh, women, and really looks at um, how the climate crisis is going to uh, depend on the ways we care about each other, um, the way we care for the planet, the way we care for um, ideas and imagination. Um, so also with this exhibition, we tried to change the way we think about uh, how we do exhibitions, everything from how the pace at which we worked, we experimented with moving slower, more slowly. Um, we worked with new materials. Um, we talked to artists about working in new ways. How do we design things that we can build on site with materials we have on site? So while we don't have this all figured out yet, it was a good experiment for us um, in real transparency of saying, okay, we're gonna see what this looks like to do uh, exhibitions in a new way um, and have these conversations in a new way. But I think the best part of this exhibition is that we really worked with community members on imagining it, 
Um, so there's a lot of community stories within the exhibitions. Um, people sent in their stories of place, way there's, ways they're experiencing climate change, but also ways they're addressing climate change. And these are objects from our collection. The exhibition is not collections-based, but we did pull items where you can see this indigenous uh, way of thinking about repair and sustainability. Um, hundreds of years ago, they were repairing objects um, and keeping them thinking about sustainability in new ways. So each of these objects, you can see a visible uh, repair. Um, but I think I mentioned that when I think about museums, I become less and less interested in exhibitions and collections. Um, and instead, I'm really interested in the ways people live and the ways we are going to be able to live in the future. Um, this is an artwork by Amy Meisner um, of Alaska, and this is called Mother Thought of Everything. Uh, it's about ways that mothers desire <laughs> uh, to take care of children and the next generation. So she uh, quilted these objects, these survival suits, to help us all think about the ways we might care um, for our families going forward, um, also reflecting fear and hope within this work. Um, we're also really interested in the idea of seven generations. So in indigenous communities, you often hear about um, not the now, but the preparing uh, cultures and children for seven generations from now. Um, if you think about sustainability, that's a much more powerful way to think. Um, and we're interested in how, um, as we work with artists and communities and um, uh, industry, um, how much people have lost a language for talking about the future, um, and how, if we think generations from now, um, how we can relearn or newly learn a language for being able to imagine tomorrow. We don't hear it much. Um, we hear the catastrophic stories of today, but not really the visioning for um, how we might steward for tomorrow. Uh, we talk about climate change and how it impacts people, the places that they live. This is an indigenous uh, Inuit photographer, Brian Adams, who photographs the changing places in Alaska. This is a community called New Talk that's experiencing uh, coastal erosion and actually had to relocate the village um, uh, just in the last few years. So these are kids that are hopping across these um, gaps that are left in the landscape as the coast erodes. To us, that's very visceral. visceral. Um, these are our witnesses to climate change, um, and it's their stories we try to um, highlight and bring forward. We talk a lot about fish in Alaska. Um, some of you may know that uh, one of our most recent uh, elected officials for the House of Representatives from Alaska ran a whole ca her whole campaign on fish um, because it represents so much of the ways we live, um, not just in Alaska, but many places. It's a food source. Um, it's how we're caring for the land. It's what we turn into industries, um, what we need to uh, think about. But the fish are really, the salmon, the king salmon are really suffering in Alaska. Other species are thriving. So for us, it's this way of thinking about climate change. So instead of curators working in our galleries or working with our collections, um, we send curators out on fishing boats. Um, they write stories about what they're seeing. They highlight the stories of climate change. They work with scientists on the research. Um, we have one curator who is a writer, and uh, this is an image from a story she wrote for the New York Times. So thinking much differently about the museum's role in what we create. Um, if we are about creating stories or highlighting stories, then working with a platform like the New York Times really changes the way um, these voices go out to the world. Um, we recently opened an exhibition about fish, so uh, an exhibition about salmon culture and how important salmon are to, uh, to places like Alaska. And um, this image I just took last week um, because to me this is a good example of how if you uh, work on projects about things people care about and really about their life ways, people turn up. Um, they talk to each other, they communicate, um, and they spend time together. And to us, this is how we start to transform conversations. Um, we work with a lot of tribal leaders in Alaska, a lot of indigenous um, artists. 
uh, and policymakers. Um, we think if we can bring different people together into the same room, maybe that conversation can start to change. Um, uh, that, I'm going to go back to fish just for a second. Um, I think the, one of the indigenous values is seeing abundance and scarcity. Um, and I was just talking to someone in the museum field the other day who said that museums, unfortunately, are really good at seeing scarcity and abundance and that we need to change our mindset, mindset stop competing with each other and thinking about the scarcity of resources and instead think about the richness uh, of, of the resources that we have, uh, which is really place and people. We do believe that while we're an international museum and we like to partner with all of you on um, climate realities and thinking about what's face facing our global world, um, if we don't think local first, we are not doing our job, so we are deeply integrated with our communities. Um, this is a space, you can see the museum building behind it, but this is a space that was an abandoned, empty building um, for years across from the museum. I can see it outside of my office. Um, so I approached the landowner and asked if we could use this building as a space that's called Seed Lab to really work on climate issues with communities. And what we've learned is that by taking away a lot of those barriers of museums, which is don't touch, um, uh, don't have food in the galleries, <laughs> um, that we took this building over, we renovated it, um, but we kept it really humble. Uh, and there are no rules in the space, and instead we host writers, scientists, energy startup companies, um, people looking at alternatives, envisioning the future, um, artists, so people occupy the space, and because they come from different um, backgrounds and different industries, they talk to each other and they share the space, and in this space we host a lot of conversations um, about food, food security, um, we have a lending library, we have a materials library that looks at alternative uh, materials that can be used, we talk about housing insecurity, um, city planning, so we work a lot across boundaries, um, way outside, I think, the typical museum universe. In the pandemic, when we couldn't be inside the building, uh, we gave the building to skateboarders who just skated inside the building. Uh, and then I think we try to be positive disruptors. So we show up to conferences that are not about museums, but are about the Arctic, that are being dominated by industry and economics. And we bring the people there. These are. Uh, these are two of our curators um, and in two indigenous artists uh, who we sent to the recent Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik. So while well, everybody talked about the future of the Arctic in terms of military buildup and economic build, build up, we reminded them that this is a place where people live, uh, where life ways are being affected, and where we see creativity as being central uh, to our solutions and to the idea of well-being. And then I will just say that uh, for us, it's really how do we get outside of our spaces? How do we get outside of our practices? The things we think we know. Um, Kirsten talked about unlearning, and we spend a lot of time, I think, unlearning. So we go out into public space. Um, to us, that's the space um, that we need to be working in, where we need to be co-creating, where we need to be better listeners. Um, I often ask the question lately, what if we took all of the assets that we have as museums, which are our big buildings, our beautiful buildings, the objects, the cultural belongings, the people, the people that care, that work in institutions, and then we looked at the uh, skill set, what are the needs of the community, um, what do we see that the community needs to imagine the future, then what kind of institution would we create, and I think it's not the museum that we all know, it's something quite different, and so every day we try to reinvent what that might be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Looking forward to having you on the panel and developing further on those ideas. And then next, Heidi, would you please introduce yourself as well? Hello. Uh, my name is Heidi Rosenström. I come from the Finnish Science Center here. I work there as an exhibition producer. 
And I will tell you about how we at Heureka communicate complex issues such as climate change with our exhibitions. But first, Heureka, I know some of you will visit it on Wednesday, but for those who won't, uh, here's a picture. Uh, we're the biggest science center in Finland. We have both science exhibitions that we produce ourselves. We have a planetarium and we do a, little, a lot of different programming uh, about science. And it's maybe noteworthy to say also that uh, uh, we think of um, science in the broad perspective, so we include humanities in it. It's not only about natural sciences. And our main audience are families and schools, so it's um, really typical for us that people come for these shared experiences and we put a lot of effort in designing them because we know that only less than one percent of our visitors come to us in groups. And uh, the target of these science exhibitions that we make and that science centers make is to foster scientific literacy and uh, foster critical thinking and, and we really talk about fostering science capital. But I think that uh, these uh, issues with climate crisis and loss of biodiversity, they are very much included in this agenda. But then when we look at why people come to Heureka, they, when we ask our visitors, they come because they want to have fun, <laughs> they want to have new experiences, and sometimes they also want to learn something new. So this is, of course, a challenge when you want to communicate climate change. And there are other challenges with climate change. As Kirsten also mentioned, it's very complex and the exhibition media isn't very suitable for, for um, giving out these really complex feedback loops. We, don't, we, we haven't got the tools yet on how to do this. And there's a lot of psychological barriers. People might perceive that uh, climate change is too distant to them for them to take action. They might perceive that the social group that they belong to Nobody else does something, so why should I do anything about it? Or it might be that you just put the short-term term gains uh, in front of the long-term outcomes. There's uh, anxiety, and there's a lot of uh, climate like uh, crisis fatigue, uh, tiredness of all this crisis in this time that we live in. And then there's the skepticists and the deniers, but to be honest, they don't really come to Heureka either. Uh, anyway, there's, we have to overcome these barriers and, uh, and surprise these people somehow to get them connected. And then there's the other side of the coin. It is that the people who come to us, very many of them are really much aware of this already. And this is a, a picture from the Finnish Youth Barometer, barometer from 2021. And uh, you can see that 90% uh, of those who answered think that uh, climate change is caused by humans. And 86% are of the opinion uh, that nature, ha nature has an intrinsic value and that uh, that should be taken into account in decision making. So also, it doesn't really make sense for us to rub it in to those young people who already know this and come to us. But we should really find, find ways to motivate. So, in other words, and now I'm quoting my now retired boss, uh, we are really in the business of motivation. Uh, we are there to light fires and not fill the buckets, and this is where emotions come in, because it's emotions that motivate us to action. And we know that emotions are powerful conveyors of messages, and they're very important in re reinforcing memories and learning. And we can use emotions for, for people to, to connect emotionally to things and to help them uh, understand or relate to more complex issues or make these things, uh, comp issues relevant for them. And we can do this by storytelling and we can do it by uh, exhibits and uh, exhibitions. And we have one uh, very certain trick on how to get people emotionally available. And it's that people are very interested in themselves. <laughs> so, so we really put a lot of effort in putting the visitor in the center in everything we do, in the interaction and in the center of the facts and try to show how these things relate to them. 
and uh, and this is also we know that this is how uh, things stay uh, stay in the mind for a longer period of time. So just a couple of examples of how we've communicated climate change in the past years. And this picture is from the exhibition Climax from 2011, so it's already more than 10 years ago, that we hosted it in Heuraka. And it's a very powerful immersion because there's 10 centimeters of water in the whole exhibition space. So it's an, uh, it's an exhibition experience you're sure to remember. And there's literally uh, the... Uh, you literally put on the boots of somebody else because you had to wear yellow rubber boots in the exhibition, so you also are um, sure to uh, see the world a little bit differently, and it awakens empathy and understanding. Then we have the shared experiences. Uh, they are very valuable because shared experiences, they also have the possibility to create shared memories. So there are things that you can come back to years after if you visit with your family. And, and those are, so, so they are very powerful tools. And then I have a really short story I want to tell about this ice cube. Because in the, for this exhibition, it was running for the whole year. And we, uh, in winter time, uh, we had ice cubes, like uh, two square meter ice cubes, collected from Lake Puruvesi in Finland. And then we had the cold containers on the backyard to keep this ice for the summer period also. And some physicists from the university had calculated uh, that each ice cube would last for around six weeks in the exhibition. They had made these careful calculations. But the ice cubes melted in less than four weeks. And now, uh, do you guess why that was? Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was like, yeah, the physicists, they, they didn't uh, take the human impact into account. <laughs> so, so they forgot that they didn't think of that people would touch and feel it. So, uh, but uh, but I, as the Clean My Ex exhibition was a, a really powerful tool for raising awareness on climate change, uh, I think when we, in 2022, last year, opened them exhibition facing disaster, we've come a bit towards action with it, because this exhibition is really about um, resilience, about how communities prevail together in crisis. And there's an exhibit uh, where you, you call it the Moi, it's like high in Finnish, so it's like the greeting exhibit, and you can record your own greeting there in the exhibition. And there's this element of surprise where you can find yourself greeting to the whole, whole exhibition hall, hall. Because greetings are a really good um, indicator of resilience. So communities where people greet each other, they're more resilient than those who don't. And we have exhibits that are simple hands-on, brains-on exhibits on cooperation, where you help to solve tasks together. And there's also these powerful immersions uh, in this exhibition. They're more about, uh, more like art, visual art, uh, art uh, rooms or immersion rooms than, than really simulations. But, but I hope, I mean, those of you who will visit on Wednesday will have the chance to see this exhibition and those, those who don't, it's still open until January this year. So, uh, in the end, when we communicate these complex issues, I think it's really important that we focus on the visitor experience and on the audience that we have and on emotions. And this is because we really have to catch the attention of the visitor. Uh, I, will go, I will think about oxytocin when I get home, but, but, but I still think that, that we don't have a very long period of time to catch the attention of the visitor. And then I think it's very important that we think about uh, these complex things, because the world is complex and we try to understand how things are related uh, to each other. But in the exhibition, we don't really need to spell out everything, because it can also be more rewarding when people get to put two and two together. And uh, I think that our role as museums and science centers 
is, is not about raising awareness anymore, but it's more about connecting uh, these shared experiences around this knowledge and this awareness, because it's the shared ex experiences that create mutual uh, understanding and empathy, and that's really what we need in this world. So, thank you. And last but not least, Kripspa. Would you please uh, introduce yourself as well? Yes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Ciprian Stefan, or the guy with the hat and the plastic bottle. A lot of you know me from the other sessions like this. I'm, uh, I will present you today what Astra Museum is doing, and is doing since 2014 for the society. We are an open-air museum, so we say, OK, what should we do regarding the climate changes and how, how to make people understand the challenges and also what can, how can we support them to understand better the solutions for the climate changes. Because rural, rural areas from Romania is so huge. We still have around 48% of the population lives in the countryside with a lot of resources, with a lot of know-how, but they don't know and they don't understand how to use those resources. And we start building programs. I won't speak about the what I have on the screen, because you can read it or you can have the presentations. But I want to tell you how we start. So we start, first of all, doing research program in the field. So right now, Astra Museum covered in Romania 100 and almost 30,000 square meters, from the Black Sea to the high mountains, where we talk with the communities, we try to find answers, we see how the rural communities are transforming, how modern materials, materials came in over there, how is the depopulations, but also how is the migrations from the urban areas to the rural areas. After we uh, receive all this know-how and also all these uh, informations, what do we have in the museum? Then we start building things. First of all, we have to preserve around 400 buildings in the Open Air Museum, which needs materials, which needs, which needs money and a lot of other things. But we maintain to use natural materials for all our buildings, but the most important thing, how can we reuse the materials for the objects? Not using the materials or uh, the tools that you find in the store, but recovering the information from the past, how they use the colors for the icons, for example, or for the pottery. It's a huge research, but in this way, we said we make some reducing of the energy preserving the heritage because we have like 3,000 artifacts. This is our scientific work, let's say, and our duty, because we still have laws that oblige us to protect the heritage. But where we find the equilibrium, the balance, how can we balance with this? Because this know-how that we still found in the countryside is relevant for us and is relevant for the museums, for the open-air museums or ethnographical museums. I told you Romania has a lot of resources, but also when we talk about the SDGs, First one, I think, is poverty, reducing the poverty. So in the countryside, in the rural areas, we still have a lot of poverty. But we have those people with a lot of competencies, with a lot of know-how, with a lot of resources. How can, may, how can we make for them a better life, but also for the communities? Not just inviting them in the museum and putting them to be like an exponent and to do a workshop for I don't know how many visitors we, uh, came. No, we try to mediate what they do for the community and to make the community and the visitors understand that their object can be used because they use natural materials and their object can be used all the time in the house, in the weekends, in the holidays, and so on. We have this kind of visitors for those events. is written over there. And our colleagues and my team we stay there together with them and try to communicate in another way. In this way, what we gain? We gain also the craftsmen. We regain the craftsmen. And we, re we regain for them their proud. Because the communist period in Romania destroyed those values. Destroyed the values and people are embarrassing when they stay in the countryside and they do a pottery or a blacksmith and so on. And we make them again proud. And in this way, we build what? We build small engine for local development. In a, sustainable, in a sustainable way, in a, in a good direction also. Educational programs is not just for the kids, it's for everybody. 
everybody can come in the museum and assist to our programs because we, have, we still have a lot of vulnerable rural communities that nobody understands them. A lot of people talk about the Roma people and the problems that Roma people bring in Europe. But we have a lot of good Roma people and nobody knows that. We have these problems in Romania. And then we make these vulnerable communities to be understood by the visitors from all the country and also from all the Europe who came in our museum. When I talk about cultural and imaginary program, there are people from the countryside. They live there. But how can we educate them to understand what is SDGs? How can we educate them to understand what is sustainability? They live SDGs. They live sustainable in the countryside. They just have to come back and find a proper solutions for the actual needs, for the contemporary needs. And that is happening in our museum. We have this movement in Romania because of the pandemia. And a lot of people from the urban areas moved in the countryside. And they want to build a cabin, they want to build a house, they want to build homesteads, and it's a risk to destroy the cultural landscape. So then we have a special program built for them, is this cultural landscape program where we teach them how to build a fence or how to restore a house using proper materials from the proximity, not using modern materials, destroying the landscape and also put a finger on the climate changes. This is my favorite part, gastronomical programs. Because we talk about the waste management and this in the countryside area, waste management was since the beginning, they didn't throw anything. Now they throw a lot. Okay, gastronomical program, it's very good for us because we bring a lot of people in the museum who wants to taste a food like it used to be, I don't know, in 17 or 18th century, using the proper instruments and tools and so on. But it's not just about that. It's how can we make people understand, if you see a potter, you can buy his products because you can cook in it. And we show them the example, not just offering the potter stuff or the food in a pottery can, no. It's not about that. It's not at all about that. It's about assuming, tasting, and feel the heritage and feel these informations that will provide a better life for us in the future. These resources doesn't have any paper. So it's a lot of issues here. And now we are able to offer them a training and we are, offer, we are available to offer them a certifications, a legal paper for these craftsmen. And in this way, they can be very well planted in the market. Don't, they won't have any problems with the, I don't know, institutions who wants to see how many products they sell or things like that, because now they will have these certifications of the competencies. For us, it's very important that those people to have these certifications of the competencies. Why? Because then they can build something good in the countryside and in the rural areas together with us and of course with the other open air museums from Romania. What about lobby and advocacy? I choose those pic pictures, why? Because we had in this summer a visit, a very important visit, by European Committee of the Regions. We told the mayors and president of the regions in our museum. And I said, okay, I won't make for them just a guided tour. It's not about that. We want to show them, because we need them. We want to show them how the museums offer well-being, how the museums are providers for the green transition, because all our know-how adapting to the 21 century needs can provide a good solutions and better solutions for the future. And we still have, in that part of Europe and also in the other parts of Europe, we still have the most important resources, human resources. It's not just about natural resources, it's about also us, people, and we have them in the countryside. And at the end, what to say? I don't want to be anymore a museum. I want to be a positive phenomenon in the life of our communities. I want to be very close to the community to educate them to understand the dangerous things that can happen in the future. I want to have snow in my countryside. I don't have any snow, any more snow since five years ago. To do that, we must reuse our knowledge and reuse everything that we have as an information in the museum to be a phenomenon, all of us as a museum, to be a part from the community's life. Thank you. Would you please join me up here? Yes. You should probably put on your mic again. <laughs> Hi. 
welcome. Also, while we are waiting for our third person, so that we are not all women, um, I would like to begin asking you each what part of the other presentation you found expiring and why. Would you start, Julia? Oh, well, I will start with um, my neighbor. Uh, we also have a science center as part of our museum. And as we think about youth culture and how people engage with uh, the museum, we uh, had a moment where we recognized that we were talking about general science art in a general way and really went back to the idea that we're a place-based museum and so the way we talk about climate is just by making all of those exhibitions really about the place. So when we talk about plants, it's what grows in the place. We have volcanoes in Alaska, so we talk about how that might affect the environment. So just yeah, talking to kids in the same fun way, but about things they are experiencing. And then by your presentation, sorry, my microphone's going in and out. Um, uh, similar in Alaska, there are very few cities, uh, so most people are in rural communities, and I think that local knowledge is deep and rich, and there's so much uh, that we can learn about sustainability by uh, being better listeners and being closer to those communities. Um, and also, I think, helping to mitigate um, the rest of the world's attention on those places in ways that's quite ignorant, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You had it? Yeah, I, I was impressed by both of uh, your museums uh, and, and the way that you work in a way that you really uh, work to be part of the uh, so, social place, as you said in the end, and also as, as you noted, that you re really try to get out of the museum shirt in a way. <laughs> put things in a, into action. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a marvelous day today and good, very good presentations. And for me, it was important to see how USA, rich country, manage these kind of uh, issues regarding the climate changes, also to the heritage, to the museums. Uh, I know a lot of things about Finland, but I was impressed by that center, and I will visit it uh, next uh, Wednesday, because next year now uh, NEMO challenges us, because next year we'll have the NEMO in Sibiu, and the level is very high, and thank you for that, NEMO. <laughs> yes. Yes, and uh, looking forward to receive questions and so on. Thank you. Well, one of the things I think is quite great with a gathering like this is that you have a chance to network and you have a chance to listen to other people's experiences. But as professionals and individuals, we have a tendency, I at least do, to brag a little bit. And there is not that much learning in that. A little bit, but not as much. So I'm curious to know if you could share one of the things that you tried and didn't succeed with, something that you really thought, okay, I'm gonna do this with my audience, I'm gonna communicate this way, and it just didn't, didn't work, and why, and especially what you learned from it. So please share your failures. <laughs> Anyone wanna go first? I'm a cavalier, I will be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are failures all the time. I think that's something that the museum community can be more open about. And certainly as we work on climate change, I think there's a lot to learn. And one of the things we have a conversation with a lot in terms of uh, the idea of transparency is to be really honest about where it doesn't work, where we're failing, where we're trying, you know, and to acknowledge that this is an effort, this is an experiment. Um, there's places we're going to fail. I also think there's a tendency to go 100 miles an hour um, and to think you have all the answers and then sometimes uh, your community reminds you that you don't have it all figured out yet. And so I think, think for us, uh, we're held accountable by our local community in a way that's uh, really stressful and really meaningful. And so uh, if we don't do things right, we will know that we didn't do things right. And there's a real, I think, communication and learning process that's part of that. Yes. Yeah, as, as Julie also <laughs> said, we fail all the time. I think uh, um, my examples are more from the, if, if I think of exhibit development, that's something where you really see, see it. And there's sometimes, uh, sometimes even though you kind of, 
uh, could notice that this maybe isn't working so well, then people still think things because there's a lot of effort put into something that, okay, but, but we just make it a little bit better and, and it will be okay. And there's some examples. For example, we have a, an exhibit that some of you will can see and you can assess it yourself uh, on Wednesday at Heureka. There's this circular factory that uh, was really supposed to be a game, but it isn't working as well. And, and it's really, you see the, you kind of get the feedback from the audience really quickly. So, uh, so it, yeah, you know you failed. At it. <laughs> it's just like try to make things better the next time. Yeah. Uh, we failed, and I failed this year uh, for uh, a part of the community. You know, in Romania, we have these uh, political issues regarding the Nationalist Party, which is growing. It's like 25%, that is not okay. And uh, they, uh, their voters, you know, are uh, against climate changes and so on. And also, they are very eurosceptics. And I, until now, I didn't find a, a key to communicate with them to see how kind, in, in, in which event should I, should I involve them, you know, to be present there to understand that those climate changes are not just stories told by the European commissions and so on. It is a truth, it is a reality. And there are a lot of them, also in the visitors of the museum. So I failed this year, but I hope next year to find a, a good solutions, maybe I can find answers also here. Because we have to be very careful with that. I mean, the stratigraphy of this, our society is in this way. We have nationalist party. We, I'm not a politician, but I saw the stratigraphy. So I have to do something as a museum, as a manager of the museum, to do something to also educate them and to be close to them, to find their, their needs and also to find what questions they have about those, about those things. How, how they can uh, analyze and how can they, I, they understand that we don't have to joke with the climate changes. It's a reality. And as a museum, we have to be careful with that. I fell this year, but I hope next year to be, to be in a better position. <laughs> and to build on that, I want to ask all of you, um, a lot of people get sort of uh, desensitized to the climate crisis because it's so big and it's so overwhelming. Uh, and a lot of people are dealing with it to just shut it down and just you know, neglect it. Have you any thoughts about how to or any experience with how to actually get through to them uh, without scaring them too much and actually make them reflect and engage? I mean, I think for us, we don't often just use the term climate change and say we're talking about climate change right now. Like that declarative statement has become unnecessary. So instead, we talk about food or fish or transportation or housing and we talk about those things that are, you know, what people are experiencing that's changing the way they live. Um, we bring people together to talk about how we might live in the tomorrow and think about creative ways to solve that together. We work with a lot of contemporary artists who are uh, raising issues and sounding alarm bells and then we have conversations about um, if this is what we're seeing and experiencing then uh, how I, we create a uh, collaborative effort to address those issues. So, you know, I think if you say climate change, people have a fatigue factor just with the phrase. So we talk about it in, uh, in these ways that uh, are really about how we live. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to, again, agree with, with you, Julie. Uh, we also don't really spell it out loud that much anymore. And it's, uh, as in the Facing Disaster exhibition, we don't say that this, this has these natural forces that you see is about climate change. And, uh, and we have now, I think, in all, all our, all our uh, forthcoming programming, the clim climate change is a part of all of the forthcoming exhibitions in a way such as our life <laughs> is like we're living this climate change age <laughs> now. So. So they're, they're an inherent part of them. Yeah, we talk about the water. Right now in Romania, in a lot of rural areas, uh, the inhabitants have uh, normal water in their kitchen and so on. But they have problems during the summertime because they, of course, they uh, wet the garden with the water from the system and uh, the system failed. And uh, they are not used with that. Why? Because when they were little, little and they have the, the grandfathers, they said, okay, our fountain, the 
fountain has all the time the water, but right now they don't have any more water. And then we have to challenge them to understand, okay, it's not okay to use, to use water in this way. And we don't talk about climate changes. We, we need to offer them examples with the effects of the climate changes. That is what we do in the museum because they don't understand the SDGs, most of them. Most of the people from the museums in Romania or in other parts maybe don't understand the SDGs, the workers. Most of the politicians don't understand what SDGs is or climate changes. So then we have to offer them examples. Look, this is an example. This is an effect. Using water in a, in a not a proper way that happens in the future. It happens right now, in the future will be worse. Yeah, yeah, I think highlighting solutions and pointing to things that are working and helping yep. people yeah. see that some work is being done and the museum's platform being used to highlight those things, I think is yep. a good role. Yep. Yeah, and we're actually also wor working on an exhibition about water and global water <laughs> resources. <laughs> use, use that as an example. I'm also a little bit curious how you as individual uh, see yourself uh, working with sustainability, what drives you and what sort of makes you go on? Um, I am, I have the honor of working in the place that I was raised. Um, didn't always think I'd go back to my home uh, place, um, but to work in a place that you care deeply about, um, where you understand or have uh, born witness to past, present, uh, and can imagine the future. I think that's compelling. Um, I'm aware that if I wasn't in a museum, I'd just be compelled to work on climate. So I feel lucky um, that museums are a place that could have a role, a very pivotal role in this conversation and helping communities um, lead forward. Uh, it's not an easy place to be right now. I think the uh, we live in a world of global activism in a way that's really powerful and in a way that's really divided. Um, so I think uh, as people working in these complex organizations at a very complex time, uh, I think we learn new skill sets and we realize we need to be surrounded uh, by people who are innovators and entrepreneurs and really thinking in new ways and that uh, maybe our role, I guess I speak as a director, is to uh, step back. It's not about me as a human being. I hope my values matter in the role I'm in, um, but really how can you be in service to our communities and the values that those communities hold? Cool. Yeah, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, we have a very, uh, we are in a, in a very special position to, uh, to talk about these things and bring, bring up these things in the museums and in the science centers. So, uh, so it is, um, I'm also very happy about being able to, to work there and I, I really see that, that the work that we do, it, it has an influence and it has an impact for a lot of, lot of people. So, so that's what, uh, what um, well, not keeps me going because I think I would do something else, but it's, it's a really, great to, to be able to be a part of this movement. Yeah. I grew up in the in a village in the mountains area and I was uh, teach when I was young to respect the nature because we live by the nature and we use things from the nature in a in a proper way. But also I know that uh, when God gives you some uh, treasures, some gifts, you have to give them back to the society. And in our museum, I have a great team, a really great team, and together we understand that, okay, for us it's not an option to travel, to go, to work in Western European countries. We have to do something for our country. And that is our way of life right now, my generation's life in Romania right now, to do something for our society and community, mm -hmm. seeing these issues and how can we manage to, to fix them. I would like to ask you, because working in a science museum, the whole thing about fake news and fake science and, you know, climate uh, being denied as being a problem and so, how do you deal with that from your professional background and the museum you represent? Yeah, I, I must say, I think we're, uh, I'm lucky to be in Finland because uh, we are very highly kind of, there's a high reliability on, on science centers and museums, so we're not questioned that often. But I know from colleagues in Europe that there, uh, there has been 
a lot of different uh, small, smaller incidents and, and issues. And, and um, I think uh, well, last summer there was this uh, Excite conference, the conference on, uh, for, for science centers in Europe, and there was also discussions about this. And, and I, I don't know, because I, was, uh, I, I think it's really nice when you said that you reach out to this, also try to, try to reach out to these populists, which is very hard. And there's like this, some, at some places they think that it's, you cannot really, may, you cannot really change the way that the deniers see it. And, and still, in a way, I feel that we should try to make the conversation, but it, on the other hand, it's quite hard to conversate with populists, so I don't know. But we don't, uh, we don't see that, that much. Julie, one of the things around your museum is that you work on indigenous land and you communicate. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on how you work together with that community and how you uh, give them the quality and the space they need? Um, sure. I mean, I, I will also say that I don't think there are that many climate deniers in the world. I think it's... Uh, it's a language people use uh, in relation to power and resources, but I think most people don't deny um, climate. Um, for us, and living in Alaska, this is indigenous land. There are um, many different tribes, not a monolithic culture, but many different cultures that make up um, Alaska, but Alaska was um, indigenous before it was Russia, <laughs> indigenous before Russia sold Alaska to the, to the United States. And um, I think we've brought Western ways of thinking to and doing to a place like Alaska that's been incredibly devastating to those communities, whether that's uh, changing life ways, taking away cultural rights, taking away land. Um, or bringing disease uh, and poverty to those places. Um, but they're incredibly resilient communities that do understand land, that do understand sustainability, that do understand uh, our own uh, quest for rethinking sustainability and consumption and uh, resources and all of those things. So for us, it's, uh, I think it would be naive to think we're giving something back to those communities. Um, I think it's uh, a partnership and we hope to be of value, but really um, my humble opinion is that we need to be very humble and that we are not gifting something to indigenous communities. We have something to learn from them and we need to approach that with uh, great list, greater listening skills and that local knowledge really holds the answers to a lot of this conversation that's happening here. If we focus on a sector level, I would like to ask you, since you're the president of the network um, in the Romanian museums, what are the biggest drivers and challenges that you think you're facing in your region? In uh, our region, uh, it's um, right now it's, we have some issues with uh, laws because uh, it's the resilience programs and the state wants to do a reformer in the museums and since uh, this July uh, the museums from the region and from the country, not just from the region, are focused on uh, fixing the issues and try to convince the politicians not to destroy the museum and or to act against the heritage. So then they are not focused very well focused right now to the main challenges. And the next year in Romania we'll have uh, elections here so it will be tough. But I think we will, uh, we will uh, in the network, I have a very good board, and with the network, we will try to make uh, the museums understand, okay, you have to rebuild your strategy, to rebuild your mission, and go further. Because other else, we will have politicians every four years. We'll have issues with them ev every year. But the main challenge is we remain, and we can destroy us if we don't fix it piece by piece, piece by piece in the future. From the speech that we heard Kirsten Dunlop do, she was like reimagining the role of the museums and seeing how we could interact with other institutions. Which institutions, if you could pick freely, would you, if you could say, okay, this institution have to work with me about this project, which institution and what project would be on top of your mind? Educational system and also environment. Mm -hmm. and Both of them we need. 
because we need the educational system also to be a part of the educational system also as a culture institutions or a culture sector, but also with the environment uh, ministry we have also to be very close to them because we we have these people with know-how, <laughs> with some informations. I mean, we don't have to live like they used to live 100 years ago or 200 years ago, but if we won't be careful, maybe we won't be able to live like they used to live 200 years ago. So those informations maybe that can help also the specialists from the environment to find better solutions. For example, wood. We talk about the wood, the deforestations. But if you do some tests and you cut the wood in the proper period, then you won't use too much energy to dry the wood. Or you can use other species of wood, which grows very fast. I mean, those informations uh, exist in the open air museums, in ethnographical museums. But of course, together with the other specialists, you can offer better solutions or a, a, a real solutions for, for the future. And if you were to reimagine the museums for the future, how do they look? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm thinking that uh, we already we work a lot, quite a lot with the educa educational system or with schools, but I think our problem in, in Finland, in a way, is, is that we are in the south and Finland is a big country with a lot of people also up north. So somehow it would be something that would disperse the information very much uh, over every, uh, overall. And I was also, uh, I think it was nice with the article series that you had with New York Times, so maybe that could also be a way of dispersing information. I don't have a good answer to this question <laughs> now, maybe great, tomorrow. I think it was a great answer. <laughs> no. I'm curious about how you sort of like you pulled down the walls of the museum and interacted mm -hmm. and communicated in different ways, if you could elaborate a bit more about that. Uh, well, you'd asked about ways we work with indigenous communities, and I think one thing we're working on now is um, removing the idea of an institution as much as we are able. So we're sharing ownership of our collection. We're giving things back. We're thinking about sovereignty in different ways. Um, thinking about how do you share that ownership, um, everything from objects to photographs to knowledge. Um, for us, it's really looking about different platforms, not just our museum spaces, but right now we're working with an artist on a project about the spruce forests and climate change that nobody will ever see. So we are um, putting tremendous res human resources into working on this project um, out in the forest um, that unless you had uh, incredible gear and a boat and other things, you will never see this um, beautiful project in the forest, but we can talk about that experience. So um, trying to learn through experiences and think about ways we share um, Sandra's in our audience. We have a whole podcast series that we do that's really trying to highlight people's life ways and creative uh, ways of thinking about the future. And Sandra co-curated with us a, a, a podcast series about museums and climate change. So it's trying to point out what's happening and the good thinking that's occurring. Um, I will also just say we work a lot with the uh, startup companies um, because it's really exciting to see that kind of in, uh, innovation and that speed of thinking. So um, we try to highlight uh, what those uh, institutions are doing and through partnering with um, other kinds of nonprofits far beyond the museum industry or for profits, um, we learn to change the way we work, which I think is uh, part of what we need to do is change the way we practice. Since you are extending the definition of museum quite a lot. Uh, do you ever have people saying to you, you cannot do that because that's not what the museum should do? It's a good question. I think our advantage, and this is probably true of a lot of mid-sized to small museums, is that there's not this huge public expectation of what you are. Um, so I used to be kind of shy about that going to conferences and thinking, oh, we're not the big museum and we don't have that amazing collection with the canon in it. and. Um, instead, and I see that as maybe now our greatest strength is that we don't have that burden of expectation and that we can continually kind of reinvent what this uh, place should mean to a community. What would you say are the biggest barriers for you to actually do what you think is necessarily to communicate and be part of the solution? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about that. <laughs> Maybe you have something. 
barriers? Mm -hmm. There is no barriers. No barriers. No. no we imagine that there are barriers, but no. I like we have that. to be very optimistic. We need optimism. I'm uh, full of optimism, really, because otherwise you won't do anything. So then, I know there is some barriers, but I don't care about them. So I go further. I go straight ahead. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a very nice answer. Yeah. And would, very difficult to yeah. follow I up mean, on. I mean, sometimes <laughs> the barrier is ourselves. I mean, yeah. I think it is, you know, the way uh, museums were trained or the the deeply embedded practices. And so I think it is like learning how to remove our own barriers mm -hmm. and seeing the world in a different way. Yeah, I think one of the, I don't know barriers, but one of the problems is then that that people who come to Heureka are pretty highly educated. So they kind of know a lot of things that we talk about climate change. So, so maybe one thing would be then, and what we are working on <coughs> also, but which isn't, isn't very easy and how to reach those that really don't come to science centers or museums. I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of US politics. You said you have an election coming up near, next year, so do we. And so for us, uh, I mean, it's not a barrier, but it's an incredibly divisive world to live in right now. And uh, I think our next year is really gonna be thinking about empathy and how do we figure out how to bridge some of these gaps that have really developed in our globe. Um, because we won't solve these problems if we don't know how to come together um, in even the smallest of ways. Also very beautifully put. Uh, I am looking down at you now. Is it time for questions? Yes, it's time for questions. <laughs> so uh, please feel free. There's one here. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if I have a question. I just have a, some of a remark over a remark or a continuation of what you said. Uh, you, Julie, you said that you don't think there are that many climate deniers on the planet. Then on the other hand, yes, yesterday, a huge climate denier was elected in Argentina. With a, and then in Sweden, we have a far-right government who was propelled into power over the discussion of petrol prices and they got the youth with them so we had like a 30 percent of the under 18s now support our right-wing government because because of petrol prices because they like to be able to drive cars in the future and i don't say that to diminish any, anything you say no, but that, I, mean, that I, is, agree. That is I hear it too <laughs> but i think it's an agenda it's not a belief system that, that's what i wanted to hear from you thank you <laughs> <laughs> Way in the back there. If you have a question and you know what, you can like put up your hand and we can get a mic to you a bit faster. Hi. Uh, as a software producer, what are you expecting of for software for, from museum software? What are the deliveries or what are the expectations that we should meet your requirements? regarding climate change. Open source everything. <laughs> no, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, a question for, I think, Julia and, and, and Cyprian. Um, you are both really advocating for your communities that you, let's say, try to represent with your museums or museum networks, um, really advocating also part of safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage. Uh, but we also must admit that some of the intangible cultural heritage is not really uh, like, like, you know, climate proof or climate friendly or however you want to phrase it. So um, can you um, raise these issues with the communities that you work with, and how does that go? How do you, you know, how do you manage to have that dialogue, and, and what is the outcome? Uh, sorry, I, I, yeah, sorry. me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, intangible heritage in Romania and the people who still have these competencies is very friendly, friendly with the nature because we're talking about the craftsmen, craftsmen using uh, traditional materials. Uh, 
organical materials and so on. So there is uh, where we meet them together with the communities and with the visitors and we as a specialist in the museum, we mediate and we communicate in a different way their resources and their knowledge, their know-how and how those products can be used by them, by the visitors in those days, exemplifying them in our cultural programs in the museum. But of course there are also issues because we have these uh, problems with uh, a lot of, uh, for example, we have an UNESCO site in Romania, it's Horezu, south part of Romania, ceramics. But a lot of ceramics came from China over there. So that is an issue and it's very difficult to manage it. You know, because there, are, there is an, uh, a huge interest by the, by the businessmen to have this import of the ceramics in Horezu, in that village, to sell it and so on, and it's not easy at all. I, here we have to make another step to have the GI for the, these people who are in, have this competence on intangible heritage, you know, in craftsmen and so on, to make the ge geographical indications for them to protect the products and to protect the, to protect the area. But it's not easy at all in this moment. I would just say we, we don't have to raise it with communities, they raise it with us. These are communities that are experiencing it every day in really profound ways. So um, for us, it's just making sure that we see the ways that it's impacting communities. Um, we do work with um, communities in Alaska that are facing climate change in really acute ways. There's an indigenous community uh, called Quinnahawk that is um, seeing erosion that is starting to reveal hundreds of uh, year old cultural belongings. So it's become an archeological site. And so people from around the world have gone to see uh, what is being found in the earth as these things get revealed. And this will be happening not just in our place, but many places around the globe, I think. And so instead of acting as a museum that would think, ooh, these objects, we should have them in our collection, instead we think about what skill set does the museum have that could be offered to this community and be of value. And so we send um, our collection staff to that location and help communities uh, create a museum, if you want to call it a museum, a place there to house that knowledge and those objects um, and lend our skill set about how you can care for those objects into perpetuity and, and share and try to be a support system to those efforts rather than thinking we are the big institution that should take and hold. Yes, so uh, I have a very practical question to uh, Julie. Uh, you talked about this uh, building that you saw from your window and decided to, that you need it and you got it and uh, you were able to renovate it. So uh, my first question is, uh, where did you get money for, for the renovation project? And my second and more important question is that were you able to use arguments uh, that like when you, I guess you applied money for that and I was thinking were you able to use some arguments that were related to to the climate change or I don't know local uh, de com communal democracy or something uh, when you applied money and what if if so what were the best arguments in your opinion <laughs> um, yeah we could talk at lunch too <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a great believer that the funding universe should follow the best idea. So um, I think often I go to funders and say, I don't actually know what the outcomes are, um, which is something I think in a way we need to be better at, that if we bring people together, um, we know that that outcome will be something transformative, but are we going to predefine that? I think that's really problematic. Um, so there was a local foundation um, that, uh, help fund the renovation of that building. It was a humble renovation. We just wanted the building to be usable. Um, and then we also received a public art challenge from Bloomberg Philanthropies to use the building and to work with the creative community to think about um, how we can transform cities. But yes, climate change and what we call sustainable communities were at the center of, of the narrative from the beginning. Um, we really wanted to think about can we take all of these conversations that are really stuck in our community 
um, and just by changing the place and the space and the ways we talk to each other can we actually um, see change. Uh, and I think uh, we call it Seed Lab for a reason. I think we've seeded some change-making conversations there. Hi, Julie. Um, my name's Hannah. I'm from Manchester Hi. Museum in the UK, and I was really, really excited to hear about Seed Lab because we're also developing a co-working hub in the top floor of our museum, which is inviting community in with a real focus on environmental action and social justice. So I guess, yeah, also love to follow up with you and find out more about the process um, because we're going through a lot of learning. But I wondered if you have any reflections so far on how that has informed your own working practices within the museum from having that kind of interdisciplinary cross-sector type approach. Yeah, I mean, I will say that I think we've had to learn a whole new skill set and the way we define our jobs and our the skill sets for those jobs is radically different than we may have defined them 10 years ago. Um, so we're really looking for those soft skill sets of people um, that know how to work and listen with people that can really co-create and it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and a much different skill set than the linear skill set we often know as museum workers. So I think, you know, I mean, I, maybe it's an overused phrase, but it's really a lot of unlearning um, to figure out what does it mean to, like, deeply listen to the needs of community? How do you bring people together in a way that doesn't feel prescriptive to those communities, where it's not us imposing an ideas on them? We really had to learn that one. We have a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and we're pretty much excited about all of them. And we really had to learn to just stop um, and think about how we can be better facilitators. Um, and that can lead to doing and making and all those things that we love. Um, but that really, that's the last skill set that we use. Um, so, you know, we have like a landscape designer on our staff who does really transformative community work because he was trained in listening. The design field is really interesting in how they see the client. Um, so bringing in people from outside the museum field in a way has taught us that um, soft skill set that I think is going to be really important to all of our work going forward. I actually have an, another little question for you. Are we radical enough? Are what you're doing just what is possible right now, or are you right at the edge? Are you pushing it enough? Uh, if we are pushing it, it enough at Heoraka. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, no, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking what we, we just had this wonderful yeah. presentation by yeah, Kirsten, and she yeah. was like st telling us to really reinvent yeah, I think, yeah, our yeah, museums. Yeah. And, and so we have a tendency to stay in our comfort zone. Yeah. Are we, are we out, how can we get out of our comfort zone? How can know. we ensure that we are radical enough? Yeah. Well, I, I, one I thing is that when people start saying, you cannot do that, yeah. if you haven't reached that, are you then radical enough? I, I think, uh, I think uh, we are not radical enough, but I, I think it's our imagination that we kind of have to let free. It's not other people standing in front of us, but, but we don't really always know the ways of how to how to go there. And I, I was thinking about this Klee Mike's exhibition for more than 10 years ago. It was really a... Uh, it was pretty radical to put the whole exhibition hall with... Uh, fill it with water and and do this kind of... But but it wouldn't... It's also a lot of, like, with, with exhibitions, it's about timeliness. And at, today, it wouldn't have said so much. It would have been, like, being radical for, like, for what? in a way, but, but we have to take it more, more into action and try to provide also ways for people to, to, to go on with these things and, and provide it. Maybe not, we don't have that many solutions and answers, but also at least give like ideas of how you can handle water so that responsibly in a way. And, and we, so, so I think our work should be about imagination. We should, we, we're entitled to imagine the future also. Do you think you're radical enough? Uh, not enough. <coughs> we still have uh, things to do. And we will do that because when the community will assume the, the museum, doesn't assume the heritage, assume the directions of the museum. So then when the community is strong, the museum is strong, then the decisional, make, the decisional makers should listen carefully to, 
to us because uh, you know a lot of power is in their hand because we can do things, a lot of things, but not so many if they don't listen to us. Because when they decide something, you know, we have to influence them. We have to, to make people understand, okay, this is the proper directions. To do that, the community should assume the, the, the museum and to understand that that museum and the heritage is their legacy. What to do with this legacy? Legacy is not just the objects. It was happens in the back of the, of the objects, in the story, in the back of the objects. What story should we tell for the future? Then we are strong, but we have to do more, of course. It's not enough. Okay. There's a question over here. Yes. Uh, is this? Yeah. Uh, I'm Lena Hanula, and uh, I'm a friend of Herminia Dean, and she's from Alaska. Do you know her? I do. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so she has been uh, collaborating with me a little, and, and I've also seen those things you have done, you know, for the climate change, those books, very beautiful, aesthetic, and informative. But then there were also these small things things, you know, concrete things like uh, those sticks when you go and eat somewhere, you can have, have your own spoon and knife and in a nice little parcel. And uh, I was thinking about museum pedagogy and pedagogy at all, how you talk to children. You can't take very big areas. You have to start from the beginning. So uh, I would like to hear a little bit about this pedagogical approach for small children, how you have started to do, do not uh, necessarily to frighten, but you know, or scare, but uh, to support. What would you like to start first to tell about climate change? I guess I'll say the same thing, which is that we learn from them. I mean, they know how to have this conversation long before we probably think they do. I mean, we have programs in the get. We have teen climate change communicators, so we work with teens a lot, and they create projects with us and with the community. For younger children, if we bring them into an art gallery and we show them a painting of a glacier and the educators ask, how do you think this has changed over the years, or we talk about indigenous land, they, they do know those answers. Um, we learn from them. Um, I was talking to a former museum professional uh, who's now in Switzerland the other day, um, and he said that uh, we need to change the way we uh, feel to children when they come into our institutions, that it can feel really restrictive and we give them a lot of don'ts, and that uh, he tells a story of a child that went into a museum and then asked the question, why was so everybody so unhappy there? Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, how do we maybe not talk about climate change, but talk about how are we going to care for each other. Museums are amazing places to start to build a new empathy and a new kind of connection. Um, I think that's our pedagogy going forward. We, we write climate change curriculum for our school districts. We write, we write our curriculum for our school districts and we really try to work in informal education. But to me, it just really comes back to the how do we, how are we humans with each other? And if we could start there, maybe we can change the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. There's a question here, yeah. Yes, um, I'm interested about impact. My name is Mari Wikholm. I'm also here from Finland. And uh, I would like to know, do you have some kind of measurements? So how do you know that we are doing the right things? How do we know that uh, our actions really affect to people's mind and awareness and their actions? Should we start over here? Yeah. I think the answer is uh, in what uh, we receive from the, from the public. And also, if I'm speaking about our museum, which is an ethnographical open-air museum, you know, I'm thinking on to the past, you know, how they use the materials to build the house. They use wood, they cut the wood in the proper period. They use all the elements from the wood, they didn't throw anything. How they use the land for agriculture, to survive, to have the food. So I think we have the, those, those answers, because to, to the other answers, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any competences to tell it, but I know that uh, 200 years ago, so, or when they start make the, these measurements, you know, meteorological measurements, you know the, the heating of the planet wasn't so tough. 
And I remember, I'm only 40 years old, but I remember when I had 14 years or 10 years old, I had a lot of snow in my region. Now I don't have any more snow in my region, in the mountains region. So the answer is in the past. The past, the heritage, and everything that we receive from the past can be a solution for the future, if we are able to find it and to look to find it, not just to find it, to look very carefully. We have the answers. The heritage and the museums can have a lot of answers. This is my opinion. Yeah, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a good question, and it's very hard to, to measure the long-term impact of a museum visit. It's, uh, I think there hasn't been even that, uh, that many tries, and it's hard to distinguish uh, from a visit what is about the exhibition and what is about the company that was there and, and so forth. So, uh, so we don't really know, but, uh, but we do this... Um, Visitor uh, studies uh, four times a year, and of course, with some like uh, according to ex like if we have special exhibitions, we ask of them. But that's a very short term, uh, uh, short term answer. Uh, personally, uh, I really got the feeling that um, that my work matters in a way uh, when I worked with an exhibition on mental health uh, ten years ago, and I still get emails about it, how it uh, affected people. And also, uh, the exhibition is now uh, in the U.S. circulating there. So uh, there was one museum who, after having hosted it, they changed their whole strategy to involve mental health in their museum strategy and mental well-being. So then I felt that we really make <laughs> make a difference, or we have the power to make a difference. Beautiful. I guess I'll just say museum metrics are broken and need to be reinvented. They're very transactional ideas of success, who comes in your door and uh, who is a member. Those things are not impact. Um, so I think those are conversations we need to have with uh, the whole ecosystem that makes up museums. Um, for us, we quit thinking that it was all about what difference are we making, but how can we support a broader effort around climate change and communities. So we started thinking about how can we create metrics for our community to measure um, how we're thinking differently about climate change. Are we meeting each other in different spaces? Are we connecting in different ways? So we started working with um, some evaluators to think about how we could... Um, uh, again, sort of lend a skill set to think about how do you evaluate uh, impact on a much broader scale rather than having to prove our own worth as a museum. So. Yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Sanna Sarkala from the National Museum of Finland. Um, and we have been discussing about here um, being radical enough. And I would like to know if you didn't have any restrictions in your museum, what would you do? To, to tackle this issue and um, bring it to the audience in the most effective way. So you don't have to think about finances or, or anyone giving you money to like, use your imagination. So no I think I'd quit uh, the exhibitions where we build the house and then take it down three months later. Um, that kind of pace of building and making, um, I think could be put to better use in terms of if, if we have those buildings as our assets, they're amazing community spaces. And sometimes I think, oh, if I left the museum and did climate work somewhere else, I think I'd crave the museum. Like, it's an amazing platform and a vehicle, or it should be. And so if we can radicalize the museum or rethink our work, um, these are incredible. It's an incredible set of tools for reaching people. It has trust, it has uh, people working within it that care, it has a community that will come and seek each other out in these spaces. So I think all of the assets are there to be radical, and so I think um, we have to think about what structures can we remove or rethink to allow us to actually achieve uh, those radical goals. And sometimes, sometimes I have to remind myself that um, if I'm too too radical or my pace is too radical, it doesn't really do any good if I'm just barreling out front. Like you do need to have those conversations, how to bring people along together. Like how do we do this together? We're not our own engine. We're part of a uh, part of a whole ecosystem that needs to move forward together. So. Yeah, not so much time to th think about this uh, answer, but maybe it would be an exhibition 
free for everybody, where, where you would first you would be in the plus four degrees um, uh, scenario and, and live that for a while together with people, or you would maybe see your, your grandchildren living there, and then you would have this uh, space where you live the future in a sustainable way, uh, according to indigenous knowledge and that kind of things, something, something from that. I didn't know if I understand uh, the questions. I don't know if I understand the questions, but uh, if I don't answer properly, then you have to translate me the questions, okay? So I'm, um, I have a great team in the museum, and uh, sometimes they have to choose, not me, because it's not good for the institution sometimes only me to choose, so they choose. Three of them are here, yeah. Was that satisfaction? Okay. We have to finish uh, up. We might have... I just have one last thing for each of you because I believe in uh, regenerative actions. So if you could just mention one thing each that has inspired you or sort of made your brain go pop uh, to share with the audience. Uh, there was a mention today about the land being the museum, um, and I was inspired by that. I'm, I'm sorry, but the land being the museum, like what if, uh, I think it was Kirsten, what if the indigenous land was the museum itself? Yeah. And, that, mm -hmm. and uh, well, I'm, I'm really inspired about how, as I, as I already said, also how you work with your communities in both places. I feel the vibe. <laughs> 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 really, I really feel the vibe. So that is the most important thing to feel. Mm. When you feel, you transmit. And yeah, I feel yeah. it from both of you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. It was uh, very lovely having you here. And I'm sure that uh, if you have more questions, these people are very approachable. After yeah. the thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>